The first Tony Hawk's game was a classic. After reviewing the first game, it really got me back into the series. So I feel it's about time we look at the second game, Tony Hawk Skateboarding 2. Whoa, wait a minute. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2? What's with the name change? So anyways, let's have a look at Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. But I think I'm going to need a hand on this one. Someone who knows the game much better than I do. Yeah, someone who's completed it 100% with all characters. The man, the myth, the legend. Tony Hawks. No, 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 sorry. I mean, Tony Cox. I need to give him a call. <laughs> Fucking answer. Speech. What? Is that Tony Cox? Aye, what do you want? Can you help me with this video I'm doing, please? What, then now? Fuck's sake, right, fine. Right, cool, see you in a bit. Right, let's get it. Well, candles. Right, let's go then. Developed by Neversoft and published by Activision, released in September of 2000 for the Sony PlayStation 1 console, it also came out for the Nintendo 64, Dreamcast and even the Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance in the following year. We will be looking at the PlayStation version today. Of course it made sense to bring out a second game after how well the previous title done. And trust me, they improved on this one from the previous title. The game engine of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 is an enhanced version of that of its predecessor. They used it to its full potential for this game. And like the previous one, Tony Hawk was heavily involved with the making. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 is more explosive, more punk, and more stylish, and they show you this instantly by greeting you with Zack De La Rocha raging out your machine as soon as the game starts while showing clips of skateboarders um, skateboarding. Before we get into the game, when you're on the main menu you may notice they have added a few new features, one of which being the Create a Skater mode. How it works here is you create a skater using pre-existing models, choose a selection of heads, pick from existing clothes, etc. It's very basic by today's standards, nothing too exciting looking back, but there is enough customization here that you'll be mostly satisfied with the character you end up creating. This was the standard of character creation on the PS1, so at the time, it was actually really great. I suggested that in keeping with the themes of punk, attitude and anarchy, that our created skater for this review should be PUNK AF. So of course Daniel created Michael McDonald. <laughs> From the way you choose your created skater's appearance, from hair, clothes and shoes, to the skater's name and hometown, it's a welcome feature which is sorely missed when replaying Tony Hawk's 1. After creating a skater or picking from a surprisingly large list of pre-existing skaters, you're good to go. The first level, The Hangout, is in my opinion one of the best first levels I've ever played. This level perfectly shows you how the game works, placing you in a contained environment and showing you how to interact with your surroundings. Yes, you can smash through the glass. Yes, you can grind a helicopter. Oh, that changed the environment? Oh, that opened a secret area. Combine this with the goals which every level has, such as getting the high, pro and sick scores, find the secret tape, collect the skate letters and level specific goals such as smash the barrels in the hangar and wall ride the bells in school too. This is how you do a tutorial, make it a fun level which gives you hints at how to proceed instead of games that give you a 30 minute tutorial on how to play. This tutorial will always be fun due to its clever design. There are hundreds of games that I will never replay because of the tutorial but this is a rare example of a tutorial making me actually want to play the game. After this, the levels start to open up a bit more, skating around streets, skate parks and a school. These are all very well crafted levels and so much fun to replay time and time again. Although there is one level that caused me so much stress when I was wee, that even though I now know how to beat it, I get Sonic 2 underwater levels of anxiety even just seeing this fucking level. Venice Beach. This ledge. It's apparently the ledge that defines Venice Beach. So what is it? This ledge? This ledge? 
No, apparently it's this ledge, the ledge that's hidden away out in the fucking back. Oh aye, that's fucking brilliant, that's what I think of when I think of Venice Beach. And apparently they want me to hit 4 VB transfers. I don't even know what a VB transfer is, I don't skateboard in real life. And where are they? And there's no even any indication on what the VB transfer is. Like, if I go from this ramp to this ramp, it doesn't work, but it does when I go from this ramp to this ramp. What's the fucking difference? Just fucking score it! Or take it away! Or stop it! <laughs> and don't even get me fucking started on this teleporting tramp. You need to ollie over him in a very specific order. He'll appear in one place, then he'll teleport to another place, then teleport to- I've only got two fucking minutes! When I was a child, I could not fucking do this. This was too much fucking stress. You'll get so much fucking anxiety through this, that it'll fucking end you! It'll be the f- it'll fucking finish you! Uh, are you alright mate? I'm fine. There are skate competitions where you'll be competing against other pro skaters across three heats to get the highest score. They have upped their game in this one with the competitions. I found them a lot harder in this one compared to the previous game. Unlike the first Tony Hawk's game where you'd need to collect tapes in order to progress through the story, you'll be granted with cash from each objective you complete which is essential for progressing in the game to finish it. This game has some of the most iconic locations in the series, from Venice Beach to the fan favourite School 2. The gameplay is very similar to the first game. It still feels very tight and the controls are still very responsive. It's hard to explain, but it just feels better in this one. Using the D-pad to control the movement and direction of travel, X button to ollie or jump for people not familiar with the radical lingo of skateboarders. When ollieing you can do flip tricks by using the directional buttons and pressing square. Same for grab tricks as well, but you use the circle button instead. There are a large combination of button inputs to pull off tricks. You can also grind in this by ollie into a ledge and pressing the triangle button. There is also a special meter that once filled up, you can pull off a signature trick for massive points to add to your score total. These special moves require you to press a specific button combination, for example, left-right circle. This mainly works, but often you will try and pull off a quick grab just to keep your score going, but your skater will try to pull off a 360 varial McTwist on flat. <coughs> It isn't usually an issue, but it's absolutely infuriating when it happens. One nice feature they added into this was the ability to manual, which wasn't in the first game due to time restraints. To pull off the manual you press the up and down buttons on the d-pad and a balance meter will appear on screen. You then use the d-pad again to keep the balance of your player so he doesn't go flying off the board. This completely opens up the gameplay and is such an improvement on the last game. No longer does your line have to stop so early, as now you can trick from one end of the level to the other end and back again. This was before features such as reverts and spine transfers were added into the Tony Hawk series. Though this is a bit more primitive, I think this balances the game out a bit better. Here there is an actual difference between street skaters and vert skaters. Vert skaters can get big air, pull off special trick after special trick and you can legitimately get a really high score this way. Or, you can trick to manual, trick to grind, scoring ultimately smaller points, but combining it all into a few lines, you could possibly destroy your vert scores. These are two completely different ways of playing, but both are as fun and rewarding in their own right. Just like how you need money to progress to later levels in the game, you will also need money for the in-game shop. Here is where you can buy new decks and new normal and special tricks. You can also buy stats for your character to level up speed, manual balance, ollie in heights, etc. It is absolutely essential to level up your character to progress through later levels in the game because it can get pretty difficult as the game goes on. I suppose if you started finding the game too easy because there's no in-game difficulty to change, if you want a real challenge, try completing it without buying stats. I've heard of people doing this on some other videos I've seen. As amazing as the first soundtrack was in the first game, they cranked it up big time in this one. Like always with licensed music, I cannot play any, but here's some honourable mentions. Bring the Noise by Anthrax and Public Enemy, You by Bad Religion, and Pin the Tail on the Donkey by Naughty by Nature. With how great the soundtrack is, the actual in-game noises are spot on too. From the noise of the board hitting the ground after nailing a sweet trick, 
to even the different environments that your skater will be in. And check this out. I had the in-game music volume down while recording the footage, and this was the first time I'd heard this. They even have a noise for the board turning. This is brilliant, and a fantastic little touch by the guys behind this. However, that does not excuse them for the completed goals sound effect at the end of each level. It's usually fine, but if you complete a level 100%, completing all goals and collecting all the cash, you are for some reason punished with this noise. For Christ's sake, make it stop. A nice new addition they have added to the game is the ability to create your own skate park. This gives you the chance to build your dream skate park from what's available in the create mode. You can stick to a realistic style or completely over the top with big ramps for extra air. Personally, I was never a big fan of it, but it's a nice little feature I'm sure many took full advantage of back when it was released. As fun as the single player career mode is, there is also a two player mode to keep the fun going. There are five types of multiplayer games to choose from. You've got graffiti, trick attack, tag, horse, and free skate. In a game of graffiti, each player has to try and score tricks on as many objects as possible, including ramps, rails, and ledges. Once you perform a trick on an object, the object will change to your colour, either red or blue. The other player can try and steal objects away from you, but only if they can beat your score on that object. The player with the most objects wins. Trick Attack is where both players battle it out trying to achieve the highest score within this designated time limit. Tag is an interpretation of the traditional game of tag, or TIG as we know it as, that gives each player a timeout, which only counts down when they've been touched by the other player and are therefore IT. The player who is IT can decrease the speed of the other player and increase the ease in tagging them by performing tricks. The player who causes the other player's timer to run out is the winner. The game Horse is played in rounds. Each round you have 8 seconds, or whenever your combo ends, to land the highest score. The player with the lowest score will be given a letter corresponding to the word Horse, or whatever you have edited the name to. The player who has all the letters to the word chosen loses. Many hours of great fun and laughter to be had, and you can't beat a bit of old school couch co-op. Free skate is pretty self-explanatory. You just load up a level, there's no timer, no goals, just skate around and do what you want. This is honestly one of the best multiplayer games we've played. Just get yourself a can of your favourite beverage and some pals. And if you don't have any pals, fear not. Just get some money together and hire yourself a prostitute. Sure a fantastic time by nailing her in the hangar. This game was met with critical acclaim and had big scores with the reviews it received. Still to this day one of the highest rated games on the PlayStation 1. It's got a Metacritic rating of 98 out of 100, which is huge. There is no wonder why this game always gets mentioned when talking about the PS1. It's an absolute classic and a fan favourite for many in the series, including myself. Definitely worth a shot if you haven't played it already. We should also mention that there is a remake of Tony Hawk's 1 and 2 on the original Xbox called Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2X. It was created in the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 engine. That's all we can tell you about it though since it was never released outside of North America. Cheers for that guys. There was also an HD remake of this and the first game combined into one that came out in 2012 and developed by Robomodo. But the less said about that game the better. It was awful and you can't even buy it digitally anymore. Think Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5, but instead of just ruining a franchise you love, it ruins all the levels that you grew up loving. If you want to scream, how did they fuck it up this bad, then it's for you. Otherwise, definitely stick with the original if you ever want to play this. Right, so we're done now? I think so, aye. Right. Right, I didn't really... I didn't really want to do this, I can do this on my own, but... I had a lot of fun, but I wrap it up. I want to go back to that some carnage. Right, well, that was our review of Tony Hawk's Pro Skateboarding <sighs> 2. Nah, if, you, two but... <laughs> if you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to be kept up to date with my future content. And uh, yep, that was it. See you in the next one. <laughs>